Let's talk about the Fourth Amendment, shall we? Let's turn to your Fourth Amendment approach. This approach is all you need to know. That's it. If Fourth Amendment search and seizure comes up, this is what you need to know. The last time the Fourth Amendment came up, July 2015. So it's not as hot as, thank you, it's not as hot as um, homicide, right? Homicide is the major area that we're going to really make sure we know. We're going to know, you know everything I've highlighted, but we're going to give a little bit more attention to that approach. We could have, like we've seen in some essays, right? We could have homicide plus Fourth Amendment search and, se search and seizure, right? Crossover. So that's a little bit of a racehorse, is it not? And that takes a lot of time to develop. So we'll start, when we start doing our in-class practice on Monday, so the way that will work is I always will bring in the issue spot after the class we've done as a re-review. So I'm challenging you to see if you've retained any of the information, okay? Um, but the point is, what was my point? I don't remember my point. But my point is that you have to do the practice to see how this all comes into play. And you could definitely have a crossover coming up on your bar of criminal law and criminal procedure. That type of cross is due to come up as well, okay? So if you're worried, go to the practice. Look, I mean, I've given you the practice. Do all of those questions. Don't shortchange yourself, okay? Clear, cool, beautiful, let's go. Fourth Amendment search and seizure. A lot of people start with the warrant exceptions. Please don't do that. If you do, you'll miss about 40 points up until that point. Okay, we start with a heading, search or seizure of, let's call it the, glo uh, the car. Enough with the glove. Who knew that one case was going to just be there forever and ever and ever <laughs> and never go away? It's a good case, but how many different... Uh, movies can you make on the OJ case? <laughs> well, after we, my husband and I finished watching that first series, then he told me there was another one. I'm like, no, I can't. I'm OJ'd out. Then I went to the John Bonet, and then I didn't sleep for about a month. But um, literally, and I was checking my kids' locks on their windows like every second. Um, yeah, for those, yeah, whatever. Anyhow, search of the car. So we need what? We need standing. And we need government conduct. Tell us why the person has standing. Yeah. No, no, no. no. I meant, in your, great, but I meant in your analysis. These are like my star law. You're all, that's it. You're, this is where you're sitting. <laughs> and you're all, you're all great. Okay, all of you. But um, you're all beautiful. So anyhow. Um, Make sure that you are not conclusory here. Don't just say, oh, they had standing because they were in the car. Elaborate a little bit. Don't go into a whole three-paragraph analysis, but elaborate a little bit, okay? Each one of these issues are about 10 to 15 points. These are your foundational requirements. You cannot... I just wrote 15th. You cannot bring a Fourth Amendment challenge if you do not establish standing and government conduct. So please make sure that you hit both of them. They're not very hard. I just remembered something that I have to bring up. Make sure that you know the informant rule in regards to confessions. It's in your outline, okay? I'll put it up here, and you know what? We'll actually conclude with it. See how many issues there are that even I need to remind myself. That's a wrinkle that they bring up. So it's not the police questioning. I'm sorry to digress in the middle of a fourth approach, but you're, you're smart enough. You can handle this, okay? Just remember that the informant can be the one doing the questioning, and it's a different standard, okay? And we'll get to it after we finish our fourth approach. Okay. So there must be government conduct, and there has to be standing, reasonable expectation of privacy, Make sure you know, per where it's listed in your um, long outline, where the Supreme Court has ruled that one will and will, one will not have standing. Okay? 
Next, what's our next heading? So always discuss standing, always? Always government conduct? Okay, what's our next heading? Good, warrant. Thank you for not saying plain view. Are we always going to have a heading warrant requirement? Yes, because logically, and a lot of this is logic, right? You can't have an exception until you first talk about what is initially required, right? So we need a warrant. So let's give the elements for a warrant in a little intro here. And what is required? We need probable cause by a neutral magistrate. Such a fancy word. Why don't they just say judge? Okay. And anything else? It has to be stated with? What is that? Particularity. Reasonable or not? This particularity standard. Specific or not? Could it be broad? Or I mean, how particular does it have to be? Like, is it the third house on the block or the actual address? Well, it can, mm, it can be enough so that the cops would know which house. As long as they have a clear understanding of where they're going, that typically will suffice. It can be challenged for sure, but it typically will suffice. So go into each now. If you have a warrant in the fact pattern, then you go into each one of these individually and you establish if the warrant is valid. Okay? Yes. Separate, separate heading. Yes. Probable cause. Neutral magistrate. And last. Particularity. Let's say you determine that the warrant is valid. Do you still go into the exceptions? I don't know. What do you think? Yes. Yes. So in the law, we will always go to the second option. Always. Because at the end of the day, this warrant, our analysis could be wrong, okay? So you'll never stop at a warrant, ever. You'll always then go into the exceptions. So you wanna make a little transition sentence and say, in the event that the warrant is in fact invalid, okay, an exception must apply. A warrant exception must apply, and then go right into any of the exceptions that apply. So in the event, that the warrant is invalid, or is in fact invalid, I would say. A warrant exception must apply. And then go right into any exceptions. So that's the scenario if there is a warrant. What if there is not a warrant? Everyone understand this? I can erase it? Yes? Okay. What if there is not a warrant? Then what do you do? Well. I still want you to introduce just the elements, okay? Particularity. And then just give, you see how I'm so big on transition words? Because by the way, that's gonna make you look as lawyerly as possible, okay? Most, most applicants will not have transition words. They will not even use transition words, okay? Or transition sentences. But that sets it up to let the grader know, here, because a warrant is not provided in the facts, an exception to the warrant requirement must apply or the search of the car will be invalid under the Fourth Amendment. Pretty straightforward, okay? Want me to repeat that? Here, because the facts do not provide for a warrant or here because there is no warrant provided for in the facts, either way. To even make it shorter, you could say unless a warrant exception applies, the search of the car will be inadmissible under the Fourth Amendment. Got that? All right. And then you go into, now you don't have to make a heading warrant exceptions. It's not necessary. You never have to make a heading defenses on the bar. They know self-defense, intoxication, that's a defense. Okay? Just go into the defenses. And you list only ones that apply. So let's go into some of them. Let's go into them. 
If you think this lecture is long, wait till we get to torts. That's probably the longest lecture. We may go over on Monday night by a little bit, just so you know. Okay? So I would anticipate maybe going over Monday night 15 minutes or so. Okay? Sorry for those of you that hate me now. More, more of this? Yes, there's just a little bit more. Okay, so what are some of our key exceptions? Plain view. Let's start with the exceptions in the context of car searches. Let's start with those. So we have the automobile exception. So your heading will be automobile exception. How many do you need? You just need one, right? But you're going to list all that apply. All that apply. When in doubt, put it down. You know, when you're uh, hitting an issue that you're a little bit unsure about, when you start writing for it is when you'll probably know that it's not applicable. Because if you really know the law and the legal standard, then the facts should be able to flow somewhat. You should be able to make an eloquent legal argument based on the standard of the facts provided. And if it really is not an issue, then you're probably pushing it, right? You ever in an essay, right? And you're like, this really doesn't fit. <laughs> Let me get out, all right? Or just delete, delete, okay? But by the way, if that happens, the key is to still keep your cool, okay? You always have to keep your composure. There's so many times that I've been in court and I'm hit, sometimes I have a great day and sometimes the other side is blowing me out of the water. And what they're challenging you on when they throw you these challenging areas or these loops that they like to give is can you keep your composure in times of stress? Are you really ready to handle the stress of being an attorney? And for those of us that have practiced, it's a pretty stressful pr profession, right? Right, okay? So yeah, if you think this is hard, just, just wait. Buckle up, because it's, it's, it's a hard profession, but it's great, it's rewarding, okay? And you're doing this for a reason, okay? But at the same time, my point is your stamina, the stamina building, it has to start now, okay? That uh, moment in your practice where you're going, oh, you know what, screw this, I'm just gonna go like eat something, or I'm just gonna go have a glass of wine, okay? Stop yourself, stop yourself now and finish it, okay? Even if it's not great, Finish it because the composure, the stamina, the focus, it has to start now. Okay? All right? I have given a few pep talks today. I'm probably going to keep coming. All right. Automobile exception. What is the key here? What do they try and trick you here on? The search. Where can the search occur? So the context is what? The car is, is it speeding down the highway? No, it could just be stopped at the side of the street. What is the context of, an, of the automobile exception? What's usually the facts? It has to be mobile. The car has to be mobile. Okay, so you're basically uh, driving down the street, right? The defendant's driving down the street? Something like that, yes or no? Okay, good, thank you. So the cop says, all right, we want to stop the car, and that level is reasonable suspicion, right? And then it has to raise to what? Probable cause. By the way, there's a great rule for probable cause in the approach that you can use every time probable cause is at issue. It's on page 147, and it's on the top. You see that bolded right there? Probable cause exists when the facts and circumstances within the arresting officer's knowledge are sufficient to warrant a prudent person to believe that a suspect has committed, is committing, or is about to commit a crime. You can use that definition every time probable cause at issue. It's the best definition, because it's, it's probable cause is one of those things that people define differently a lot. So that's a really good definition for it, okay? So under the automobile exception, states may allow the warrantless search of an automobile if the police officer reasonably believes that the vehicle holds evidence of a crime. The U.S. Supreme Court has decided that this exception is not a violation of the Fourth because drivers have a reduced expectation of privacy and because a vehicle is inherently mobile. So when they stop the car and then they want to search, where can they search? The scope of the search. That it should be in your rule statement. So one should be to search needs probable cause 
and then the scope of the search is where? Is it the front, the trunk, the whole thing? Where? Can they search the trunk? Yes. You say no, you say yes. Yes or no? Yes. Yes, they can search the trunk. Make sure you know that. Come up with a song if you need to. I had a woman last bar who rapped all of the law. I was like, I'll buy that off you. <laughs> Just to shoot, you know. I thought that would be cool. Like, some song, something to get. The automobile exception includes the trunk. I'm not going to try and rap. <laughs> I just think that would be horrific. Um, Wouldn't they need to have probable cause that there was the item in the trunk? So if it's something that wouldn't be... So at that point, probable cause has already been met. Okay. Yes. So in order to actually search the car, they have, like, they see something. There's some actual evidence of a potential crime. Okay? So that is the key for the automobile exception. What else? Let's keep going. What else is in the context of a car? Well, we have search incident to arrest. By the way, these both tend to be tested at the same time. You know, every exception is about 10 points. So if you miss one, you know, if you only hit the automobile exception, you're like, okay, I got the car one. Nope. Look for this too. So it's important when you're going through your memorization that it's not just standing alone, right? So you're going government conduct. What happens there? So what about an informant? Standing and, you know, what places does one have a reasonable expectation of privacy, right? Things held out to the public. Things held in private. What about areas that are more murky? What about, like... Anyone remember the fact pattern of the dog on the steps of the house? Yes. You, you took that. Okay, yeah, that was a nightmare question for sure, for me as well, looking at it going. So basically, they assigned an entire essay. It was the last time it was tested. It was the last time that Fourth Amendment was tested. They assigned the entire essay almost was on standing. So the exceptions were not highly applicable. And if I haven't assigned that essay, that it was July 15, I believe. Um, let me just tell you for sure. So if you want to take a look at that. Oh, it was for sure. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> How bad? That was a bad essay, right? It was a, oh, well, then you know what? Can we see it? <laughs> it was, a, it was it, for most people, it was a hard question because most people are wanting to get to these exceptions, right? But you can be in an essay where the standing is the major consideration, OK? So it's important that you know those standing rules and you know where one potentially could have or not have standing. OK? Clear? Good. Let's move on. Search incident to arrest. So there's two different standards with this one. We have searches. Let's start with the context of a car. Because there's a separate standard for search incident to arrest anywhere else. So the Supreme Court came down, and you do have to know this new standard. It's not actually not that new anymore. Under Gantt, okay, which changed Belton. You don't have to know case names, but for those of you that like case names or remember the standard, Belton was that contemporaneous in place and time, okay? That standard still stands in every search incident to arrest outside the context of a car. So search incident to arrest on the sidewalk, in a home, typically, is where it comes up. Contemporaneous in place and time, and we'll go over that after we look at the context of a car. However, the Supreme Court in Gantt came down with a new standard for search incident to arrest, and it's pretty shitty, okay? It, it's pretty shitty. There's hundreds and hundreds of blogs that have been written about this standard. It's confusing for those that practice within this area, but I've narrowed it down to how you can write for it and get it correct, okay? So I'll t you'll see in a moment why it's kind of a shitty standard. So we have, if you look at page 148, you need a lawful arrest. A lot of people miss that lawful arrest, okay? So what is a lawful arrest? One that is supported by probable cause. We may go over like five minutes today, okay? What time is it? 
yeah, about five, ten minutes, we'll go over. And then, if you look at the paragraph under the heading search incident to arrest on page 148, the arrested person is unsecured. Huh? Anyone else find that standard a little bleh? The arrested person, yeah, it's blah. The arrested person is unsecured. The arrested person is unsecured. And within reaching distance, that's great, of the passenger compartment at the time of the search. How could that be? How could that be? How could it be? So let's just, does anyone, everyone understand why I have an issue with this standard? Okay. Right. Okay. Or, so there's two ways, two ways that they can search. That's the first way. Okay, unsecured. Both ways first start with lawful arrest. Okay. Unsecured. That's one way. Or second way, which is probably what most uh, is supported, I would say it was used most, is police can conduct such a, such a search when it is reasonable to believe that evidence relevant to the crime, evidence relevant to the crime for which the occupant was arrested might be found. That makes more sense, right? So it's an or. It's very important that you note that that's an or. Who did not know this discrepancy before today? Did anybody not know this discrepancy that has been changed? Everyone knew that this was a new standard? Fantastic. Great. Um, so let's talk about that quickly. Unsecured. Basically what that comes down to is there's just a way that the defendant could still access it. Maybe kick it, maybe stomp on something like a bong or I don't know, is that called a bong? What's the pipe? A pipe? A pipe, some cocaine, contraband, something that there are some pretty violent, um, people do get violent when they're arrested. I know this is a touchy subject for a lot of people right now, so please, this is n let's not get political, okay? I have nothing to do with politics in this class, and I will never bring up politics in this class, but for purposes of the bar, and that's important, because on the bar, don't get heated. I had a guy say to me once, oh, that scenario happened to my mother, and so I just went off. Don't go off, okay? Let's keep it politically correct, and let's just not get emotional about the things they test, okay? Um, and they agree. So unsecured police can search a car following a lawful arrest only if they have a reasonable belief the person arrested could have accessed his car at the time of the search. It does not make 100% sense, but basically the facts will have to tell you that maybe the defendant broke away, okay? Maybe they still could have stepped on some sort of contraband. I mean, their feet are pretty loose, right? So the facts will have to tell you there's some way that they're still unsecured or they're searching for evidence related to the arrest. That's probably the way you're going to get the search incident to arrest met. Okay? So they're searching for evidence. That's the second way. Can you discuss both I would. Okay. And I've given you a lot more language and explanation here on that. Okay? So... Make that, make sure you read that on your own time, okay? The rest of page 148, because we do have to keep going and kind of wrap this up soon. So, um, which is okay, we're almost there. Excuse me? Where can the police search within this exception? Can they search the trunk? No. No, good. They cannot search the trunk, but what about the surrounding wingspan. Yes, good, make sure you know that, okay? And that is an all search incident to arrest which is within the context of a car. For every other scenario, search incident to arrest will remain within the contemporaneous in place and time standard. So for every other scenario outside the context of a car. So if you look at Where is it? It's somewhere here. Automobile. And then B on page 148 on the bottom. 
In order for the police to search an incident to arrest, the search must be contemporaneous in place and time. That is your standard, okay? For every other area. Okay, other exceptions. Inventory search, know those. Every other exception gets tested. There is not an exception that does not come up. Plain view, highly, highly tested exception. Almost every single Fourth Amendment approach, excuse me, essay will have this exception. Consent, consent has a lot of different wrinkles. You should know them. Can spouses consent on behalf of one another? Can roommates consent on behalf of one another? You'll for sure see these questions on the MBE. They like to test, can parents consent on behalf, on behalf of a minor? Okay, so you should know the consent rules. Stop and frisk is another key exception. If you were to say what are the five top ones, automobile, search incident to arrest, plain view, consent, and stop and frisk. Those are the five main exceptions, and you'll see that in the IRO. You'll see those exceptions over and over again. Border searches and inventory searches tend to come together. That's really, they're really minor, they're not tested quite frequently. And then I want you to always, if this comes up, bring up exigent circumstances. We see it in almost every model. So you list, okay, if you have questions on the exceptions, you can ask me after class. I know some of you have plans or so, so I'm gonna wrap this up in about five minutes total. We have, again, standing, government conduct, always. Warrant requirement, always at least bring up what is required for a warrant, right? Then we go into, if there is a warrant, we have to separately head note out what a warrant requires, right? And then still say, if the warrant is invalid, however, we still may need an exception and go into any exception. If there is not a warrant, say because there is not a warrant, an exception must apply. Pretty straightforward, and go into and separately head note out any possible exception, okay? You're not done. At the end of your exceptions analysis, make a conclusion as to which exceptions, if any, apply. So, government conduct, if I'm just gonna do like the headings, warrant, Exceptions, always be on the lookout for at least two to three. At least two to three exceptions, always. Okay? And then go into a conclusion as to if any of the exceptions apply. Based on the foregoing, since there are no exceptions to the warrant requirement, what will happen to the search of the car? unlawful under the fourth and then make a subheading for always the exclusionary rule and determine whether or not the search is going to be coming in or not and then always consider any exceptions exceptions to the exclusionary rule You could be done here. You could be done at the exclusionary rule unless you have fruit evidence. So if you have a confession or if you have some other item that was seized, okay, that's not part of that initial search, right? Then you wanna make a se separate heading, fruit of the poisonous tree. Now that could be a separate call as well. Give the general rule for the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine and then also consider any exceptions. Always exceptions and defenses, separate eye racking, right? Right? Okay, and then last, um, make sure you know the harmless error test, okay, that came up um, long time ago, but you should know it. It's basically on appeal 
what is the standard if the defendant appeals um, saying that the search items should not have come in as a violation of the fourth. There is a standard on appeal of the harmless error test. That is, that could be, it will be a separate call, a specific call. And if you look, just to conclude, on appeal, it should be overturned unless the prosecution can show harmless error, which is measured by a beyond a reasonable doubt standard. So what's the argument there? Just to be clear, what's the argument that the prosecution is going to make? But tied into the beyond reasonable doubt standard. Um, all of the elements are still met beyond a reasonable doubt to convince the defendant of whatever crime charged. Great. Okay, so it's important not only that you, you understand a standard, but you also know how to analyze it. Okay? All right, so just before we go, before you all run out of here, um, let me make sure I brought up all my points. Good, 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 good. Okay. So, Crim Pro could definitely come up as a crossover with Crim Law, could come up as an entire essay on its own. I'm going to say either or, we're probably going to see a criminal law or criminal pro question. Okay? All right? You know the areas. Um, make sure you start really getting the law into your head. I've given you quite a few days with this, these subjects, okay, because they are so hot. Um, and, you know, I like to spend some time with the MBE subjects. If you are having any issues, any questions, come up. I can stay a couple of minutes longer. And good luck on your first writing assignments. I'll see you all on Monday. Have a good one. Stay warm.